Welcome to Fertility Friendly Food. I'm your host, Stephanie Velarkis, accredited practicing dietitian and nutritionist and director of The Dietologist, an Australian-based practice focused on optimizing fertility through nutrition. This podcast will bring you snack size episodes for you to learn, grow, and be inspired by the latest research, facts, and practical lifestyle tips about eating well for optimal fertility, helping you cut through the confusion and myths to take back some of the control on your fertility journey, one bite at a time. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Fertility Friendly Food, the podcast. My name is Stephanie Velarkis, and I'm an expert fertility dietitian and nutritionist and founder of The Dietologist and, of course, your host. And today's episode is all about endometriosis and irritable bowel syndrome, or IBS. Now, before I go any further, this is your absolute last chance to save your spot for two nights masterclass, Thursday, March 31st, 7 p.m. Australian Eastern Daylight Saving Time. It is on tonight. This is a jam packed power hour live masterclass where we dive in deep on all things diet and inflammation because endo is an inflammatory disease after all. And Proceeds from every ticket being sold are being donated to the Pelvic Pain Foundation of Australia, who are doing amazing work in the educational space of trying to educate people about endometriosis and other pelvic pain disorders. So without any further ado, let's get into this episode, but I just wanted to put that out there. There's still time to save your tickets. Just head to the link in the show notes. So... Before we go into this topic, we need to define what IBS is, irritable bowel syndrome. It's a bit of a vague umbrella term that basically defines a chronic disorder of the large intestine, and it's characterized by common symptoms of bloating, gas, abdominal pain or distension, so that real stretched um, appearance of the abdomen, um, diary or constipation, And there are four main subclassifications of IBS, IBS-C, constipation dominant, IBS-D, diarrhea dominant, and IBS-M, mixed type, and IBS-U, which is your unclassified. So these are all, you know, really common. About 15% of people have IBS and it affects two times more females compared to males. So naturally, there's going to be, you know, if we think about a Venn diagram, there's naturally going to be some crossover anyway. But we actually know that people that live with endometriosis are far more likely to also receive a diagnosis of IBS as well. But more on that in a second. So So this topic of IBS, we have touched on briefly before in relation to endometriosis on our period poops episode back in season one, which is by far one of our most popular episodes. And if you've heard my endometriosis story, you'll know that I received a misdiagnosis of IBS prior to receiving a diagnosis of endometriosis. And this is extremely common, Um, but also IBS can come after a diagnosis of endometriosis as well. So it can go either way. Now, there is a lot of overlap and distinguishing between the two is difficult. Um, And so this is really how we get, you know, those delays to diagnosis when it comes to endometriosis because endo is you know, sometimes characterized by these gastrointestinal symptoms, particularly if you've got bowel endometriosis, but not always. Um, So common symptoms that people with endometriosis experience include abdominal pain, um, including pelvic pain, bloating, nausea, constipation, sometimes vomiting, painful bowel movements, diarrhea, and flatulence or gas. So this is an area that I see a lot of in the clinic. And I guess the question becomes, why, what's the connection? What is the overlap? And I guess a component of it is endospecific, and there's probably a hormonal aspect to it with prostaglandins creating more um, 
bowel muscle contraction, which then irritates the gut and that creates, you know, other more frequent bowel motions like I talked about in um, the period poops episode. But I think the, the common card here with endometriosis and IBS is actually around um, a concept called visceral hypersensitivity. And so visceral hypersensitivity is a term that we give to the sensitivity of nerve endings that innervate the abdomen. So there are obviously nerve endings that innervate our um, abdomen and also internally. And basically, people with endometriosis and IBS both share this commonality is that our nerve endings are more sensitive to the same amount of pressure, gas, gastric contents than somebody else. So a great example of this is if you and your friend both eat the exact same meal and you both produce, say, 500 meals of gas um, as a result of that meal due to fermentation and so on. The person that doesn't have IBS or endo or um, visceral hypersensitivity issues, they may feel fine. No bloating, no gas, no gastric upset at all. Versus somebody like you and I, who are probably listening, who have endometriosis and or IBS, are going to produce the exact same amount of gas, but we may experience symptoms of bloating, gastrointestinal upset, distension, gas, and pain. And it's got nothing to do with necessarily how much gas is being produced in this instance, but how sensitive we are to that uh, pressure. And I think this really does make a lot of sense because our nerve endings, when we are in chronic pain, become trained for pain. And We, I I mean, the whole pain threshold debate is a different story for a different time. But my point is, is it may take less for those nerve endings to fire and send back to the brain a stimulus of pain. So that is one potential theory that connects these two. And so the stats are that about about 50% of people with endometriosis may also receive a co-diagnosis of IBS. So the question now becomes, what can we do about this? What can we do about navigating both endometriosis and IBS? Well, first of all, you need a clear diagnosis for both of these causes. And especially when it comes to IBS, you know, IBS, it can be really commonly diagnosed and other more sinister um, diseases haven't been ruled out. Not to trivialize IBS, but IBS isn't an inflammatory condition. It's a functional gut disorder. It's extremely uncomfortable and can impact your life, but it isn't going to cause damage or increase your health risks um, across the board. So we need to make sure things like celiac disease have been ruled out, especially before any dietary exclusions are initiated. And also um, inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis and diverticulitis all need to be ruled out first. And so it's really important before you just listen to this episode and go, oh, great, that sounds like me. I got IBS too then. It's really important that you go and go through the proper steps of being worked up because I think sometimes when you have endometriosis, I've talked about this on my Instagram page before, but when you have endometriosis, it's really easy to go to blame everything that we experience from a health perspective and symptom perspective on endo. And it may be endo, but it also may not be. And so that creates then a delay in diagnosis of other chronic health conditions that require completely different treatments, completely different management strategies to give you relief. Um, And it creates a delay in diagnosis of other conditions. So it's really, really important. I just really want to emphasize that. So in terms of what we can do from a dietary perspective, there's lots of things that we can do to manage both IBS and endometriosis at the same time. A few key strategies before we go into um, the low FODMAP diet, which is um, what I know people are anticipating I'm going to be talking about in this episode, which I will get to, is I just want to talk about some other strategies before we get to the low FODMAP diet that are worth trialing. And this is called 
first line strategies. And sometimes we get enough success with implementing first line strategies without needing to proceed to a more restrictive diet like the low FODMAP diet and win, 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 right? Less restriction, more liberalization, and we get an improvement in symptoms. Amazing. So my first tip is to make sure you have a consistent mealtime routine. So don't skip breakfast and then eat a massive lunch and then you know overstuff yourself and then have a really small dinner that inconsistency in meal volume and meal routine can in and of itself be a bloating trigger um, and ibs trigger other things to be aware of is alcohol um, the fat content of your food and the fiber content of your food and having a play around with each of those elements may be helpful the other thing is think about how much air you're sucking up in your everyday eating and drinking. So if your water bottle has a straw attachment or you drink everything through a straw, your iced coffees, for example, you might want to consider that too. Speaking of coffee, caffeine can be a gastric irritant, particularly for those who are diarrhea dominant. So you might need to scale that back or switch to decaf and see how that goes. Other strategies include ditching the gum or mints. Um, this is part of FODMAPs. Um, they are typically really rich in sugar alcohols and as are a lot of quote unquote sugar free products. And if you are consuming a lot of, you know, commercially available sugar free products like gum and mints and, you know, sweets and treats, they can have a laxative effect and draw in a significant amount of gas and water into the bowels. Also take stock of how well you're chewing your food. If you're not chewing your food very well, you are going to need to break it down somehow and that's going to create an additional amount of work for your gut to do and that can contribute to slow digestion and that may also um, create a issue, okay? So take just 15 minutes, sit down, eat, breathe, slow down, don't scroll on your phone, it makes a difference. And my last first line strategy is think about your breathing. And this is really important because breathing and diaphragmatic breathing in particular is going to help create more space in the uh, abdominal cavity for your gut to expand more upwards rather than outwards. And so um, there's some awesome videos on YouTube about demonstrating diaphragmatic breathing, but it's really important that you tune into that gut brain axis as well, because that plays a really important role when it comes to um, IBS management as well. So let's now talk about the next step. What happens if you do all that, doesn't work, you want to consider the low FODMAP diet. What is the low FODMAP diet? Well, FODMAP is an acronym for fermentable, oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols. And thank goodness there's an acronym. These are all short-chain carbohydrates that can be poorly absorbed in the small intestine. So they're not being digested properly in the small intestine. So they end up in the large intestine or the bowel. And this is where the most amount of bacteria and other microbes are found. And it's like, you know, putting a child in a candy store. It is rapidly fermented and digested by these microbes, which then creates an excess amount of gas and also fluid being drawn into the bowel, which can contribute to things like bloating and discomfort and, of course, passing wind and change the frequency and or consistency of your bowel motions. Now, the expansion of the intestinal wall is then going to trigger those nerves that innovate this abdomen region and send sensations of pain and discomfort back to the brain. And so multiple studies have shown that the low FODMAP diet, which was designed by Monash University here in Australia, helps improve the overall symptom severity and quality of life of people living with IBS. And also the low FODMAP diet seems to be transferable to the endometriosis population as well. And it shows a similar level of efficacy. So it's about 50 50 to 75 percent of imp of people with both endometriosis and IBS who follow the low FODMAP diet see an improvement. So the thing about the low FODMAP diet is is, is commonly thought to be a long term diet, and it's not. 
It is a phasic diet, which means there are three distinct phases. And in each of those phases, you're doing a different thing with your diet. But it's the last phase called personalization that's going to be your longer term diet. So the first phase is substitution. You're swapping out higher FODMAP foods for lower FODMAP foods. The second phase is the challenge or reintroduction phase. So you're challenging the different types of foods that contain the different types of fermentable carbohydrates to see which ones you're sensitive to and at what level. And then the third phase is once we've got all this data and information, we're able to build a personalized diet that works for you. And this is a approximately three to five month process on average because when you're on your period for example it's probably not super accurate data because like I said period poops so we do need to factor all that in and my biggest I guess encouragement if you're listening to this podcast and you're thinking hmm this might be something I want to try out then I would strongly, strongly, strongly advise you do not Google how to do the low FODMAP diet because I find it is extremely oversimplified and you do need to see a dietitian who knows what they're doing about the FODMAP diet. And sadly, doctors don't cut it either. I've seen far too many people be given a a single A4 page handout about how to do the low FODMAP diet from their well-meaning doctors and end up feeling more confused, no relief and highly restricted in their diet. I've personally done the low FODMAP diet and yes, it does take a little bit of effort, but it's certainly achievable. It is achievable to do the low FODMAP diet, get your answers and get relief. And that's really the aim of the game. So don't fly solo on this. It, uh, every time somebody flies solo, they end up coming back to us anyway. So don't fly solo, get help, work through it. It's worth it to get the answers. And at the end of the day, I always say to the people that I work with, with endo and IBS that, you know, we need to be seeing a significant improvement to warrant the restriction. If there isn't, you know, 50% or 80% improvement in your gut symptoms with the low FODMAP substitution phase, it's not worth proceeding to a challenge phase because the level of restriction you're going to potentially need to maintain needs to be worth the improvement in symptom. If you're only 5% better, is 5% better really worth cutting out, you know, certain foods in your diet longer term? Probably not. So it needs to be significant. The aim of the game is as much um, liberalization of the diet, as much flexibility, as much inclusion with minimum symptom, minimum pain. And that's really ultimately where we want to get to um, at the end of the day. All right. Key points from this episode. IBS and endometriosis is a common co-diagnosis and Many people receive the diagnosis of IBS prior to being diagnosed with endometriosis. And so you really have to reassess whether it is IBS or endometriosis, the symptoms that you're experiencing. They're commonly linked and potentially via the process of visceral hypersensitivity. And that is common between people, both with IBS and endometriosis. There are plenty of diet and lifestyle strategies to trial for managing gut symptoms associated with endo and IBS before you consider the low FODMAP diet, which is a research diet that can significantly help improve your symptoms of bloating, abdominal pain, constipation, diarrhea, and gas. So this is the final episode in the endometriosis mini series for March for Endometriosis Awareness Month. I hope you enjoyed it, endo warriors. Like I said, tonight's the night. Our anti-inflammatory masterclass for endometriosis is on. I'm so excited to see you there. If you haven't snagged your ticket, the link is in the show notes. We're donating $10 of every ticket sold to the Pelvic Pain Foundation of Australia. And I can't wait to blow your minds with my strategies that I share with my clients every single day. So 
If you enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts and use the new rating feature on Spotify. This helps us out so much. And don't forget to hit follow or subscribe wherever you're listening and share it with a family member, friend or colleague too. It always helps us reach more ears to help make fertility friendly food the leading fertility and reproductive health nutrition podcast. And let's do it together. Hey. All right, everyone, I'll catch you in the next episode. Bye.